Good morning. Welcome to the ATSAP. Welcome to, uh, um, wait, I want to say it exactly, Carlo Ratti and Ricky Burdett. It's an honor for us to have you both here. This school has a long story and interest in curricula in urbanism. It's going to be a wonderful occasion to discuss with you the issues that concern the problem and the problems that concern our cities. Um, it's also an honor for us to host one of the events of this marathon of ideas and events that the Open City Thinking Biennale triggers. Uh, in a way, cities are the space where ideas confront and melt, an area of um, uh, agreement between differences, but also space that has to be organized and shaped in order to work. Welcome in behalf of the director. I'm not the director of the school, but welcome in behalf of Felix Olaguren, who's now uh, flying uh, to the US. Hello. I... Thank you. Thank you. All right. Can you give me a No, no es volem avorrir en presentacions, però sí que volia, no sé si fer un català o en anglès, no sé, no sé què és millor en aquest, en aquest context. El Carlo i el Ricky entenen pràcticament totes les llengües, amb la qual no, no és un problema. De totes maneres, només per dir molt, molt ràpidament, potser em passo a l'anglès i així és per cortesia amb el Carlo Rat i el Ricky Perret. Um, this is part of a larger, as you probably know, this is part of a larger event that's happening mostly this week, which is called the uh, Open City Biennial in Barcelona. This has been an event organized by the Barcelona City Council with the idea to reflect on the contemporary condition of cities. I was asked to coordinate a small part of that, and that small part um, is, is, um, is been understood as a series of conversations on the city. Um, there's been a series of conversations already every afternoon, every evening. There's going to be another one tonight. There's been one on Lisbon, one on Medellin, one on Dhaka last night. And the idea of those, um, of those conversations are based on a very simple conviction, or a double conviction somehow. I don't know whether um, my colleagues would share that. The first thing is that the city doesn't exist, but only cities exist, in plural. So in a sense, it's good to talk about specific cities in order to try to, from each one of them, uh, extract certain principles, certain ideas that all together might give us uh, a better understanding of the complex condition of the contemporary urban um, condition. Uh, the other conviction I was talking about is that conversation is a form of creation of knowledge which is absolutely necessary in today's world. So that's why in these conversations we're having in the evenings, we're always trying to put together an architect or urban designer and uh, someone who's not an architect and urban designer. And in, so normally writers, filmmakers, journalists, and so on. And it's not that the world is divided into architects and not architects, which could be, but it's not really like that. But it's also part of a way of thinking that we will be exploring more in detail tomorrow with Richard Sennett, um, whose last book, Building and Dwelling, tries to, <clears throat> to make an operative distinction between the um, built city and the lived city. And um, those who make and transform uh, the physical city, and not only the physical city, but the cities we understand it, and those who live in it, and those who use it, you know, its citizens. So that's a very important thing to me. Today, um, there's going to be a slightly different format. Uh, Carlo Ratti and Ricky Bardet will give um, individual short presentations, and then we do hope to have some time for discussion and questions and thoughts. Uh, just very briefly, uh, I'm certain you all know both of them, but Carlo Ratti, is, uh, has a very, very, very complex um, background in terms of uh, being both an architect and engineer, studied, if I'm not mistaken, at um, uh, Turin first, then uh, Paris uh, Engineering, Pont uh, Chaussée, then a PhD in Cambridge, and uh, now is teaching at the MIT on the uh, Sensible Cities Lab, which is a very, very uh, sharp uh, research institution that he's probably go he's going to tell us about very quickly. Ricky Baudet um, has done lots of things, um, often around architecture and the city. He is running the uh, programs of, um, of cities at the London School of Economics for many years, together with uh, Richard Sennett most of the time. But uh, Ricky has lots of, both of them actually, have lots of connections to Barcelona. Ricky was an advisor to Pascual Maragall, if I'm not mistaken. He's also been an advisor to the mayor of London. He's been the head of the, or whatever head, of the architectural committee that dealt with the London Olympics, 
has, so he's been involved in the actual transformation of, um, of important cities in many different ways, and he also has been uh, the director of the Venice Biennale, uh, Biennale a few years ago, I think 2006 or 2008, some, some few years back. So it's a real pleasure. I hope that, um, that we enjoy it. Then there's going to be, as I say, two short presentations, and uh, Eulalia Gomez from the Urban Design Department here, del Departamento de Urbanismo y Urbanización del Territorio, ha tenido la amabilidad de, de moderar la conversa entre Ricky y Carlos. Así es, muchas gracias y con la bienvenida al Carlos Ratti. Gracias. Hola, buenos días. Um, voy a hablar inglés. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be with you here today. I'll keep it very short so we can have more time really discussing with Ricky and with all of you. Um, so what I wanted to do today is tell you about some of the work we've been doing at Sensible City Lab, but also at our design office, and I title it the Urban Guts, and I'll tell you in a moment why. Um, so first of all, you know, I want to start with this picture, because in the 1990s, people thought that because of digital, physical space would be less and less important. So people thought because of the internet and so on, there would be a death of, a death of distance. Death of distance was actually the book, the title of the book, written in the 1990s by Francis Cairncross, a UK economist, but also people because they thought the death of cities. So Gilder, 1995, thought the cities would disappear. We are headed for the death of cities. Cities are leftover baggage from the industrial time. Well, what does this tell you? The first thing it tells you is uh, never make predictions about the future. Because no prediction could be more screwed up than this one. We know the cities have been thriving over the past few years. Um, you know, that's a picture from Tianjin in China. China, this century, might build more urban fabric than all of humanity ever built. We know, as I was saying, that uh, as half of the world's population now lives in cities. And uh, this number could actually uh, swell to 5 billion by 2030. Actually, Ricky Budes Biennale, beautiful Biennale, Venice Biennale in 2006. Really look at that as a starting point. You know, what's, uh, what does it mean and how can we measure it? So cities, so digital hasn't really killed physical space, as people thought at the beginning. But digital and physical at the same time are recombining. And they provide an incredible new lens to rethink what is architecture, how we understand the city, how we can use this new data to design it, and so on. Well, we're here in Barcelona, and you all know Cerda, you know, the father of modern Barcelona, who in the 19th century, in his great book about urbanism, he was saying, I wish one day planning could be like a science. I'll have access to this data in order to design better a city. At the time, he didn't have it, but we have it today. So we're looking at that and exploring that, both with our research operations, Sensible City Lab, and with our design office. That means, you know, all this data means we can actually sense the city in a different way and respond to that. But what I want to talk to you today is about a, a possible application of this, which is also how we can make our whole economy uh, in our whole cities more circular. And here I'm borrowing something from my fr uh, friend Bill McDonald, also he worked a lot with uh, uh, Ricky, uh, uh, about uh, you know, going cradle to cradle. How can we look at this, all the flaws we're coming from and when they're going? So I want to share with you a few projects about, about this. We're doing this just shortly with Sensible City Lab. Um, it's part of MIT, so we're in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Also, MIT has a research operation in Singapore. We've got a small lab there. We have a design office in New York, in Italy, in uh, London, and also with um, uh, some of the startups uh, that have been coming out of, uh, of both of them. So the first thing is that, you know, when you look at circular economy, it's very important to look at where things are coming from and where they're going. So I'll share with you a few or the experiments we've been doing here. Uh, the first is about you know, where products are coming from. And in uh, 2015, we were, asked to, we were fortunate enough to do two pavilions uh, at the World Expo. As you know, the World Expo is the World Fair. 2010 was Shanghai, 2015 Milan, 2020 will be Dubai. And uh, one was the New Holland Pavilion, but the other pavilion was uh, this thing. Uh, that is, was what they call the pavilion for the future. And the brief we got was, uh, can we design a supermarket of the future? Well, why a supermarket? Because the topic of the expo was uh, about feeding the planet. And so it was important to see how products you know, are farmed, how they're transformed, but also how they're sold. And this was both a pavilion and a real supermarket. Now, as an architect, this is a project not from, a, it is a project that was done in our design office. So as an architect, I need to tell you, I take no responsibility for that kind of shoebox. The shoebox was given to us, but we could do anything we wanted inside. And we knew what we did not want to do. We didn't want to do this. <clears throat> it's a beautiful picture. It's a picture by Andreas Gursky, one of the, you know, today's greatest photographers. But it's kind of an alienating picture of the supermarket of the 20th century. 
So um, our inspiration was Italo Calvino. And you all probably know Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino. This is from another book called Mr. Palomar. And Mr. Palomar is this kind of character by Calvino who's a little bit aloof and provincial. And one day, one day goes to a cheese shop in Paris. By the way, guys, there's still a few seats here. If you, there's still a few open seats in, in front here. Um, and uh, one day he goes to Paris and goes into a cheese shop and uh, starts thinking about all the stories behind every piece of cheese. And little by little, that shop becomes like a museum. Calvino say like the Louvre. Behind every cheese, there's a pasture of a different green under a different sky. The shop is a museum. Mr. Palmer visiting feels as he does in the Louvre. Behind every displayed object, the presence of the civilization has given it form and takes form from it. And so basically telling story behind products, understanding where products are coming from is not new. For instance, Tesco, a big supermarket chain based in the UK, but operating globally, tried this a few years ago in Seoul. This was in the Seoul subway. And the idea was you take your phone, you scan a product, you learn everything about it, and then you can decide to buy it. But if you look at that, that's a bit alienating. If you look at that, you know, it's yourself with a screen and another screen behind. So you know, that, we thought that was not the solution. That was something that lasted for six months and they took it down. Our idea was, can we use technology to bring back to life something like this? And if you look at this beautiful painting by Guttuso, um, look at the amazing richness of interaction between people and people, or people and people through products. So how can we bring that back into life? And the way we did it was, um, first of all, we put everything on tables. The table is a beautiful interface. As humans, we've been using tables for thousands of years, for sharing things, for selling things, for eating together. And then on the top of the table, we put a lot of Kinect sensor to see how people approach a space. With the idea that basically if you approach an apple and you touch an apple, you know, you can buy like today in one second. If you've got three seconds, you can learn a bit more about it. And if you've got 10, 15 seconds, you can even see the video of where that apple is coming from. So we designed the whole uh, supermarket as a as kind of a theater. We like the idea that from the top, you could see all of the products in one, in one go. And with the different layers of information, the physical one, the digital one, and that's the aggregated one. So almost like the measuring all the clicks. You take the clicks concept, the click concept from the digital space back into, into physical space. So um, this was actually the built uh, pavilion. Uh, it won a number of design prizes and was one of the most visited pavilions at, pavilions at, the, at the expo. Um, <clears throat> you see here the interaction within the products, the different tables across it, uh, people playing with it. Uh, kids loved it because you could go from one to the other and this kind of accordion of information would open up in, uh, in front of you. Uh, here is a short video. Show you another short video about that tells a bit more about the project. Designed by Carlo Ratti e Sorciati for Expo Milano, the Future Food District is a thematic area that explores the impact of digital technologies on the production chain. A lab and living museum where people can experience a new way to shop. The Future Food District overturns the traditional supermarket layout. Products are organized on large tables. Like a traditional market, the horizontal landscape becomes a floor for conversation. The buying space becomes a meeting place once more. Every product has a story to tell. Through a simple hand gesture, products reveal augmented information about their stories, properties, and paths. This in turn promotes more conscious consumption patterns, fostering new modes of exchange between users and sellers. Through the use of technology, we can achieve a new level of connection between people and food, a more ethical and transparent production chain. The integration of advanced automation technologies generate unexpected synergies. Yumi, the world's first truly collaborative dual-arm robot, was unveiled at the supermarket. Future Food District forecasts a possible future scenario where technology can help us reconnect with the production chain, changing our relationship with food and with our fellow citizens. So that was kind of our one of our explorations about you know, how can we learn more about things. And then it, the, the idea being that if people know more about where things are coming from, then perhaps we can actually change some of our consumption patterns. 
Now, that was, that was the only project I'm showing you today from our design office. Uh, today, I decided to focus less on uh, design and more on the research we, we are doing. So another project we got interested in is actually what happens after that. So fine, we know everything about products. We know everything about the supply chain. We can have more informed consumption because of that. But then what about when we throw things away? And that's particularly important when you look at electronics. So if you look at electronics a few years ago, we started getting interested in the fact that basically, if you take this computer like there on the table, today you know everything about it. Every chip in the computer, you know where it was produced, how it moved on the planet, how it became that machine. But then if in a few years you stop using it, you give it to somebody else, you sell it, at some point somebody will throw it away, and then you know very little about it. Sometimes this is what happens. You know, a lot of electronics, e-waste from developed country, from Europe shipped illegally to Africa, from the United States to Asia. So we started thinking about the removal chain. And if you look at it, it doesn't change that much. You know, think about not the supply chain, but the removal chain. This is actually New York over 100 years ago, and how people dealt with waste. And what I'll show you now is actually, in the next video, it's a nice video we did, uh, some work we did with Armin Linke, um, probably know Armin as a, as a great contemporary photographer. It went to the most sophisticated waste management plant today in the United States. Looks pretty much like the same. It's this. So things haven't changed that much. Also, the removal chain is something interesting. You know, we take it for granted. You are a citizen, you are an architect, you don't think about it. You throw away things, you forget about it, they, they just disappear. Out of sight, out of mind. But actually when, for whatever reason, that stops working, then you realize how important it is. It's actually the city of Naples when, when actually the, 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 the waste removal system stopped working. So, uh, and there's also very interesting issues about environmental justice. Look at a couple of maps we did in the United States. The first one we actually went to look, this is not our map, but we went to look at toxic waste and race in the United States. And you see a very, very high correlation between the two. Or look at the following map where you actually, you don't see it very well. I don't know if you can maybe turn down the lights. But basically what you see here is a red and blue map of the United States, which is not red and blue like Republicans and Democrats, but it's not that different. And what you see here is actually the blue are recycling facilities and the red are uh, landfills. And what you see is that basically where you've got big cities and the price of land, of land is very expensive, like next to New York, is New York and Boston, you see Miami down there, you see the big cities in California, Seattle. Um, then, you know, where land is expensive, then we recycle more because we cannot just waste land. But actually, where land is cheap, we just throw things down in the, into a landfill. So you see there, you know, all the red, which is really a lot of rural uh, America. And, uh, and this is also, you know, rural America is also where you get a lot of uh, Republican, vo Republican votes, while cities are traditionally much more democratic leaning. So our idea was, you know, what if we could put a little chip on trash and then start following it? So we put a little wireless device into trash, and then we start following it and see what goes to the right place, to the wrong place, you know, where it ends up. You know, how we can understand more about this kind of supply chain. It's something that, you know, nobody really knows today. Because everybody does a small piece of the chain, but then, you know, nobody's tracing the whole thing from beginning till end. Now, we couldn't find anything over the shelf to put, so we, we had to engineer it. To engineer, it's almost like doing a miniature cell phone. You need to get something that gets location and sends it back. If your cell phone, you charge it many times, once a day at least, and then transmits a lot of data, here you want to have something that you don't need to charge for 3, 6, 12 months and transmits very little amount of data. So you need to be very, very smart in the way you use your battery and your connectivity. So we designed that with uh, working with Qualcomm, who is one of the big chip manufacturers. But, you know, we had to do, it was quite fun, you know, thinking about how you engineer a, a, a cell phone in just a few months. Um, we had to try how we put it in in order not to, not to be, you know, if you put it in, throw it into garbage truck a lot of stuff will, uh, will be damaged. So actually we, we try different ways to protect the tags. Um, and we try, you know, then uh, we work with volunteers to look at different things we could uh, tag. And we try to do it in a way that those things are representative of all the things that actually are thrown away in the city. So we work with around 500 volunteers who came with every type of things and uh, we help them to embed the tags in them. Um, this was actually a lady, I, this was a lady, a young lady who came and said that her boyfriend wanted to split, split up with her because of a teddy bear. And she said, well, at this point, he's either a teddy bear or me. 
And so she decided you know, to, to, to pick the boyfriend and, and throw the teddy bear, but saying, at least I want to know where the teddy bear goes. So, so we put a tag and she could follow the teddy bear in the, in the last journey of a teddy bear. And, uh, and here you see some of our team with volunteers, kids, and grown-ups up in Seattle, again, around 500 people. We came with thousands of things. There's a nice story because we collected all of this in, uh, you know, in Seattle, there's a nice new library. Not, not the new anymore, it was done probably 15 years ago by Rem Kulas. And uh, so we didn't expect such huge participation from the city. So people came to the library with huge amount of waste. Some people even with a, an old washing machine and other things. So they, they were very passionate. They filled the whole library. The librarian got scared. Uh, you see here some of the other things that people came with. Um, this was um, the deployment. 500 people, 3,000 tags. We tagged everything, everything from e-waste to banana peels. And uh, then after tagging all of them, we started following them. So here you see 3,000 objects, the day of deployment in Seattle. After a couple of days, you see some of the main landfills next to Seattle. And actually, a big surprise how far stuff, star, stuff, stuff started to travel. Look at a crazy trace that went all the way to Chicago, changed his mind, and went back to California. And a lot of stuff still moving after one month or two months. Our World Symphony was, was the right music here. So what did we learn from this? The four lessons I wanted to share with you. Well, the first one is that, you know, really we, we learn a lot. Today, everybody does a small piece of the chain. This was kind of the first time that the whole chain was, was traced. And we look at that, you learn a lot. There's so much energy we'd actually save by using this information. So many things we could ameliorate. So here you see, you know, just a yogurt container, how it moved, that was fine. But, you know, char rechargeable batteries, you see how far they travel. Uh, I'll show you in a moment. Sometimes we put more energy than what we will ever recover from, uh, from recycling them. Uh, look at those. As I said before, you've got two printer cartridges. So they go to the same destination. They start in Seattle. They go to the same destination by going through totally different routes. Uh, in one year, traveling for thousands of miles to get to the same point. Um, we also discovered places such as this one. This is actually a gravel facility in the United States. And this is not an approved EPA facility in the United States. Um, but then a lot of waste ended up there. And uh, so, you know, that's clearly there was something illegal or fishy going on. We actually sent them an email. Uh, of course, you know, they replied, you know, we have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but certainly there was something strange going on. Waste ended up in, in that place. So again, your know, data means we know more about what goes to the right place, the wrong place. We can actually then help to fix some of the systems we, we live in. Uh, and then if you map this, you look at, you know, different type of waste and how far they travel. And at one point you realize that you're putting more energy. Sorry, guys, in the, in the back, if you can just, yes, thank you. Um, if you're putting more energy, uh, then what you will ever recover because of recycling. So that becomes interesting, you know, how you can optimize this in order to save energy overall and create a more optimized uh, system. So um, those are some interesting things about, you know, how we can actually use data in order to better understand the system. In this case, an urban system or the recycling system, and we can use that then to design it better. The second thing that's very important is also data means that we know more about the consequence of what we do. And so just by sharing the data with people in this project would actually allow volunteers to get a page like this and they could actually share and we could actually look at their own data. You know, that per se can be a very powerful agent of change. Data means we know more about the consequence of what we do. And so we can then change our behavior. As a, as a, this was the, the same portal where the lady looked at the teddy bear in the, in the last journey. Um, but this was the portal where you know, some people told us, I'll tell you a little anecdote. One person came to us and said, you know, I used to drink water in plastic bottles every day. And then forget about them. But now after the project, I know those bottles go to a landfill next to home. 
They will stay there for thousands of years. So stop drinking water in plastic bottles. Very, very simple, but quite powerful. Data itself can be a very big, important change to change the city. Maybe that's something we can discuss later also with Ricky, whose, uh, whose whole work has been really looking at the meta city, at the city made of data, and how that can help us to design better, but also as citizens to take different action. Um, another thing we discover is that in the first uh, project we did, actually we tracked things inside the United States. But then we saw a lot of stuff that we ended up at ports and so on. So over the past three years, we've been working with one of the main, one of the main NGOs dealing with uh, waste, especially toxic waste, and we discovered places such as this one in the middle of the jungle. If you go on our website, you will see all these traces. This was the largest ever e-waste tracking project done. Uh, around 200 traces, all of this is e-waste from the United States going all over the world. Some of those traces are legal, some of them are not. But again, the idea that data means we know much better what happens at the global scale, and then we can fix it. We can fix this in this case, for instance, by putting pressure on politicians so that they close loopholes, saying, you know, they look at this in a more serious way. Once you know what's going on, then you can fix it. And if you're interested, all of this is on our website, and there's also a special by PBS. The national TV channel is like uh, TV uh, in the United States. They actually follow some of the traces and so where they ended up in in China and other parts of, uh, of Asia. Now, the final thing is something that we didn't expect. It's something that was, uh, was uh, utterly unexpected. Um, and that happened when a burglar came to our lab at MIT. And um, this poor guy stole a lot of things, including tags and computers, to tell you where they go. And this is what happened. And uh, the last thing I want to share with you is a project we are still working on. And as we kind of enjoyed getting our hands dirty with trash, we starting to look where other things are going. And in particular, we started looking at sewage. And sewage is very interesting. You know that in our body, for every living cell, we got around 9 or 10 bacteria and viruses living with us. And that's what's called the human microbiome. Now, in the future, it is possible we'll be able to measure the human microbiome for each of us every day because the human microbiome is a very big determinant of our health. But actually, today we cannot do that yet. But the interesting thing is that in the city, you actually have sewage, which is a beautiful aggregator of uh, all of our microbiomes. So we said, what if you go into sewage, sample sewage, what can we tell from that? And so we started going into this. Um, and you know, the idea is, you know, can we really measure our collective gut? The questions you can answer are quite interesting. First of all, you can look at, can you look at epidemics before they happen? Can you detect there a virus, like the influenza virus, before people have influenza? The interesting thing is that with newest biology technologies, you can actually look at sewage and get at the obesity rate of a neighborhood. Or you can get the diabetes rate of a neighborhood. Or how much heroin is consumed in the neighborhood. I mean, that is actually very interesting in order to, to understand. Uh, if you think about the obesity rate, also the relationship between urban form and, and health. So basically, the question is, can we use this as a platform to better understand health in the city? by looking at our collective gut. And you know, today, if you think about sewage, it all goes away and uh, is thrown into, you know, is, uh, is clean and is thrown into the sea, into the river. But can we capture it in the city as it goes there and learn from it something? And uh, can we do it in real time? So again, if there's an issue, we can take action 
for instance, for, for epidemics, as we said before, which is nothing new. I think most of you probably know this map. It's a very famous map by John Snow in London. It's a map that actually allowed to understand how cholera is transmitted. And what John Snow did was look at all the wells and realize actually a lot of cholera cases were clustering along well, uh, around wells. And that's you know, when people started thinking, well, maybe it's about what, something that's, that's actually transmitted through the water to what we drink. So I think analyzing some of the system, the sewage system or the water system, can actually just tell us very important things about diseases and about the health of the city. Um, so the question is, you know, how do we do it? Where do we do it? And so on. So we started working on this. The, the other thing is that in the beginning, we worked on, uh, we actually went manually into sewage in order with a bucket to get the thing and, and then went to our colleagues uh, in biological engineering to, to look at the sequencing, all of that. So we looked at all the DNA of the different viruses and bacteria we could find. Um, then we realized that it was not that fun. So we went to knock on the door of our colleagues at uh, computer science. And we started designing a leader robot. Uh, you see it here. It would go in the sewage and do it for us. So you see here some of the initial sampling. This was the first robot. We called it Mario, Mar.io. Um, and uh, you see it here, it was go down. The second one was actually Luigi, much smaller one. Um, you see here the little video. So this is a journey into sewage. Luigi was the second sewage sampler, as I mentioned. It goes down, it actually collects sewage. Then we do some analytics there in real time into sewage, and some of them we bring to the lab. So what you see here is uh, some of the stuff that comes out and then we take it to the lab. And, and what you get is quite interesting. So what you see here in these visualizations, if you find them online, we're still working on this. But there's really some very interesting data about the health of the city. You look at the bacteria, and from the bacteria, we know a lot about, uh, about all of us. And again, if you share it, all of this is public information on the website, again, can create some interesting feedback loops, as we, as we saw before. So somehow, you know, what you saw here, uh, this is still in progress, so I'll stop it here. Next time I can tell you more about the finding. There's already a startup that came out from, from the lab with a few students who decided to turn this into actually doing this on a massive scale in the United States. But basically the idea is how we can we look at this dimension of the city? And overall, as I was mentioning at the beginning, how can we use all of this to better understand flows and ultimately be able to design cities where we close the loop in cities that become more circular? Where actually we know better where things are coming from, we map where they're going, both products and sewage, and, uh, and somehow through that we can create more and more an economy that goes from linear to circular, the kind of the cradle to cradle example I, I told you before. So I'll stop it here, I wanted to put it on the table, hopefully for the discussion with Ricky and with all of you in a moment. And for those of you in the back, I think there's still a few seats here if you, if you want to be more comfortable. But thanks everybody. So this is the non-Hollywood lecture. Okay. Uh, I don't have any videos uh, and uh, very few bullet points. But, uh, and I mean, if Carlo has been talking about the urban guts, I guess I'm talking about the urban metabolism. So there's definitely a synergy there, but probably from below and deep inside, I'm going on the surface and above. Uh, and much of the work that I'm talking about is actually part of a new book called Shaping Cities, and Carlos has the one copy in Barcelona today. So what I want to talk about uh, is really the relationship between the physicality of the city, that which you in this room are responsible for uh, contributing to, or in some cases making, uh, and the impacts on human beings, the impacts on society more broadly, but also clearly on the environment, and this is where clearly there's a connection point between what you've just heard from Carlo's work and uh, from ours. I mean, in the end, we're interested in understanding cities as systems, and uh, our interest at the London School of Economics in understanding shaping cities means 
shaping society, I mean quite literally, making it more democratic or more authoritative, and using the design of space as part of that discussion. And I can assure you I've been at the London School of Economics and Political Science now for over 15 years, and some of you here know this, it's not easy to convince a macroeconomist or a specialist in issues of political economy that space matters. Other things matter, whether you're healthy, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're productive, but I think there's a lot more work to be done on understanding the correlation between city form and all the other issues I've discussed. I mean, we need to sometimes remind ourselves what a city is about. And this is a picture taken last week for a new project we're working on in Kampala, in the capital of Uganda. It could be anywhere else, right? In many ways. You've got to think back what might have Barcelona been 200 years ago, London 300 years ago. But I'm zooming at two different scales. If you stand back, you begin to see how transport, let's call it, yes, the guts of transport in terms of movement and everything else are part of a bigger picture in terms of what the city is. And the relationship between these two is fundamental. The form of public transport you have and the type of city, the form of city, is absolutely essential. But when you begin to zoom in, not as deep as Catalan, but when you begin to zoom in to what happens there, this is what happens in cities has always happened and I think will continue to happen. There are two people making a transaction, selling, exchanging, in this case is goods, but very often it's ideas, universities, it's transactions of uh, things, objects, uh, money and elsewhere. And I think until this changes, and I don't think not even what Cadillac tells us will make that change, uh, cities will be there and whatever we're told about urban growth that can maybe be stopped, I don't think it's at all possible as long as people will want to come, need to come uh, to cities to do a number of things. You know, and this city here uh, has grown and changed and adapted to changing technologies, changing so, uh, social networks and also systems of governments in ways that I want to come back to. But maybe the key word, and this is where resilience or incrementality the ability to act on a city as if it were a human body really become quite significant, but significant for architects and not just for systems designers. Because either you let things go, as in Mexico City, where there is no governance in terms of urban planning, I'll come back to that later, or you try and plan things. And there are definitely extremes. Uh, this is an extreme of Hong Kong, which is one of the most highly sophisticated, organized, systems of urban form and urban governments that I know. Highly efficient, there is absolutely no doubt, we'll come back to that later. But the impacts of actually living there, what does it mean to be in a smaller, cramped, but efficient space, is something that needs to be discussed much more. And unfortunately, many of our disciplines, of course, no one who studies here at this great school of architecture in Barcelona would ever go back to China and design an environment like that. But maybe yes. Because in the end, the requirements of the market, the requirements of society, uh, require that a place like this in China, a model village which is completely privately owned, is designed to actually exclude others. So this notion that space can be used to actually be inclusive or exclusive is important. And when you go and read, and you can see it from the, on the way, the diagram imprinted on this aerial photograph of a real place, and that says that it's the play area for kids and children, everyone in this room knows that that's not where children are ever going to play or hang out or do stuff. So the connections between language, aspiration, and design, I think, is essential. So the work we've been doing uh, over the years has been tracking, as uh, was alluded to before, uh, information that is out there in many ways, but important to reflect on what it means. This is taking the UN projections, the statistics that we saw before, and simply showing you on a world map where the yellow dots are most intense, where the urban growth over the next 15, 20 years is gonna be. In green, it's where it's been over my lifetime, uh, and in light green over the last 20, 30 years. 
And it's very straightforward what you see here, is that most of the urban growth is actually going to concentrate in Africa, parts of Asia, including India, and of course China and the Southeast Asia. Interestingly, Latin America has actually slowed down because most of the growth happened 30, 40 years ago, and parts of Europe and parts of the United States, much before that, in fact, 150 years ago, and there are parts of uh, the Eastern Europe, parts of America, particularly the Trump voting parts of America, and that's important, where urban growth has declined. You actually have the exact opposite. So wherever we are in a city where there actually is growth, I think we're in a positive situation. The real question is how do you channel it? Now, the two things are obvious here. These are areas of the world that are clearly, relatively speaking, poor in terms of income per capita, but that's going to change over time. And they're also low energy. So there's serious questions about which pathway is chosen in terms of the future of those cities. That's why it matters to this generation, your generation, and the people who come after you. If you just take the statistics, you don't need to read the details here, it doesn't matter. But it's quite extraordinary. If I ask some of you before coming into this room, or I asked myself a few months ago, which are the fastest growing cities in the world, right? We sort of still think of Mexico City or whatever. In fact, let me just read out. Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, Luanda, Angola, Lagos, Nigeria, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Kinshasa, Congo, so it goes on, Africa. That is the fastest growth, and much of this, we'll look at some images later, is completely unplanned and informal. There are cities like Lagos, which is something like 60, 70, 80 percent is completely unplanned and disorganized in one level, but of course that doesn't mean it doesn't have an ecology and a vivacity to it. Just to put this in context, every minute and a half that I'm speaking to you, or Carlos supermarket, you buy an apple, that sort of thing, uh, one more person has moved into Kinshasa, Dakar, or one of these other cities, or is born there. Natural birth and national migration actually lead this change. Think of what that means in terms of timing of the requirements on sewage, on housing, on hospitals, on education, and everything else. So those are the challenges that are there, and these cities will continue to grow, even though the connection, this could have been obviously a sewage chart, uh, but it isn't. <laughs> It's not a chart of where goods are moved when they're recycled, as we just saw. It's actually where money is actually transacted. But that's changing too. China's becoming much more dominant in that relationship. So you can't talk about cities without talking about what's happening around cities. I think that's one of the key points that I want to stress. Because until this person uh, will earn more than when she or her son or her daughter will earn uh, in the city than on the fields, urbanization will not stop. It's very, very simple. And there is nothing that proves to me that that is the case. If we look at some of Carlos' statistics and just recraft them, what we're talking about is 2.5 more billion, billion more people actually moving into cities by 2050. And we've seen that most of it will be in Africa or uh, Asia. It's the last issue which I think becomes really significant because we still have choices to make. So there's a political, there's an ethical, there's a design aspect to this which I think is significant. You see it on the right over there. We actually have more to do and therefore fuck up more in the world or make it better. That's a technical term we use at the LSE. We can either mess up the future of our cities or try and steer them in the right direction when it comes to urban growth. Just a reminder of the social and the environmental side. In the yellow dots that you saw a moment ago, in that part of the world which is growing most rapidly, at least, at least one out of every three, just think of that, who's sitting next to you, look left and right, is going to be living in some form of slum without access to basic sanitation, infrastructure of that sort, not to mention uh, running water toilets or anything else. That's one social dimension which I consider a social time bomb unless we actually deal with that issue when it comes to also equity, equity of access to services and to much else, not to mention a roof above your head. But the other dimension is implied by everything you know, everything that has been mentioned before. 
Cities are what they are because they bring people together, they transact, they do business, they make things, they exchange ideas, and they use energy. Up to 65%, something like that, of world energy is of course used by cities, if you include uh, industry next to it. That's why they come together. They come to do stuff. They come to ship, they come to ports, because that's where the industry is, that where the goods are taken and moved on to other parts of the world. As a result, 60s, uh, cities contribute something like 75% to global CO2 emissions. Now, some of you may say this is horrific. I actually think it's very positive. Why? Because if you actually design cities, think of the next generation of cities in such a way that they can reduce their environmental footprint by even 4 or 5%, the impact on the planet is actually quite considerable. And it's not by chance that the IPCC report, which came out 10 days ago, the one that Donald Trump, of course, uh, says is uh, fake, uh, he knows this stuff, of course, um, uh, made reference and the first time that cities are being talked about as part of a solution, not just bigger issues, very important issues like deforestation and others. Now, there are two other aspects that will fuel urbanization, and they're all interrelated. The more cities and other things contribute to the climate change problem uh, through to CO2 emissions, the more climate change will affect cities because cities are in the most fragile points of the earth. They're on waterfronts, nearly all of them. They're next to rivers. So just a small amount of sea level rise actually causes these conditions. And one of the projections at the moment is that 100 million more people will become as what is referred to as climate change refugees. And they'll go to cities. And they'll be exposed to risks and threats. Another thing is man-made. Who would have said seven, eight years ago? Not that long ago, at all, right? That most European cities at the moment, of course Spain included in Barcelona, is very much on the front line of this issue in terms of accepting people from abroad who are in need of uh, some sort of support and protection. Who would have thought that we had to take our old, creaky, beautiful cities, whether it's Madrid, whether it's Paris, whether it's Barcelona, whether it's Milan, and have to deal with this level of influx? So the need for cities to be resilient becomes even more significant from this point of view, and it is a design issue. Tempelhof Airport in Berlin, Many will recognize that this was a big debate for years. Should we use it as a park? Should we use it as a community space? Should it be a place for art? In the end, as only the Germans could do, we have beautifully designed a refugee center, which I hope won't be there for long, only because I hope we can deal with the problem in more significant ways. But the ability to actually absorb difference is fundamental to this issue of equity. And I will, if we have time, Carlos, but you're going to tell me whether I'm speaking for too long, also talk about this in relation to one of the major projects I've been involved in, which is the Olympics in London. It's not dissimilar to this question of uh, equity, because if you take a map of London, again, if we have time, I'll go back to it, and take a DNA of where people with more deprived backgrounds, in other words, uh, less educated, shorter lifespans, and that's in red, live, compared to green, which is the opposite, more affluent, more middle class, uh, and better educated, you can see that London, that's the city I live in, has an imbalance, like every other city in the world, whether it's Barcelona or, or elsewhere, has an imbalance of equity. And I think the question for a designer, for a political leader, is how do you try and disperse that inequity so that it's not all concentrated in a ghetto-like chunk. The Olympics was, London was and is very much about that. As I said, the work that uh, I'm talking about is the result of now 15 years of research and conferences under this project called the Urban Age. And every two years we hold a major conference, last time was at the Venice Biennale, in fact, uh, and soon it will be in Addis Ababa. And we run a number of programs, including executive programs, to do with that. So the research, sorry, the research com which comes out of that is now in this new publication uh, which is available. What we've realized over time, and this is not becoming less architectural and less spatial, but you can't talk about cities. Just as Carlo 
rightly says you can't talk about cities without understanding the guts of actually how it works. We feel increasingly that you can't talk about cities unless you understand the power structures, the level of uncertainty, uh, what is actually emerging in terms of unexpected change, what are the physical and other constraints, but also, therefore, how do you intervene and actually make a difference? So in the book, there's a lot of data, there are a lot of exciting essays, including some by Carlo and other colleagues. The most interesting thing is that when you've done research for a number of years, you can begin to actually look back uh, and also clearly look forward, which we'll talk about. Uh, and one of the things we did was um, track, for example, how a city like Shanghai in 1990 to now, to 2015 actually, to be fair, has changed in terms of its density. Now, what does density actually mean? If in this room we have this many people, uh, the tallest spike is the maximum number of people in this room now. If we double or triple the number of people in this room, you get what you see on the right-hand side. It's got nothing to do with the height of buildings. It's to do with the density of people. This is at, at the heart of the discussion of making cities efficient or, of course, overcrowded. So one of the things we've looked at, and this is by design, centralized Chinese state, wanting to make Shanghai what it is, you know, the, one of the world leaders in terms of economy, business, and much more than that, you can actually see, simply by tracking it, what difference has actually happened. It's not just an increase in numbers of people, it's an increase also in the density of where these people are. And let's take another city in China, Guangzhou, and look at what is happening. These are familiar sort of images, but probably what is not familiar is this image here. Uh, in 1990, Guangzhou was that big. In 2015, it's that big. Over there is the city of Singapore, that many people talk about. In the darker colors, you see how it was, and the lighter colors, how it is. The most important here is one is, can you manage growth, not by sprawl, but by actually increasing density? Because I think that is one of the critical issues that have to be addressed. In the case of Guangzhou, we had a population rise from roughly 2.5 million to 25 million, roughly 1,000%. But it's that number. The city spread by over 3,300%. 3, so those issues have enormous impact on everything. Uh, how much uh, services do you need? How much infrastructure do you need? How much public transport do you need? In China, to be fair, at least there's an investment in transport in order to support that change. And Singapore is an extraordinary example at the other end of actually densifying, intensifying, and only planning around high levels of public transport and higher densities and mix of uses. You know, these issues happen in New York, they happen in London and elsewhere. But unless you understand the power structure behind them, I don't think you can sort out the physical issue. So design is important, but understanding the politics of design are as significant. These are the mayors of two cities which happen to have held and will hold the Olympics, Tokyo and the uh, London mayor on the right-hand side. But the discussion between who actually is in control and whose voice is represented is something that is continuing to be discussed and debated in your city. It is and will be at the next election. Uh, what is interesting here is not just whether you have a mayor uh, and whether that mayor represents the uh, popular culture and the aspirations of the electorate, but also who is the electorate and who actually is responsible for voting. If you take a city like London and you look at where people live, which is the, brown, uh, the, the dark gray, the red line shows where the mayor has the power to actually decide on transport and on many other things. You'll see that one of the largest cities in the world, Mexico City, the mayor of that city actually only is responsible for one-third of the population of where people live. And the politician here and the politicians here for the last 50 years have been from different parties. They don't align in terms of their objectives. That's why Mexico City has some of the problems you know. I think what I'm talking about resonates between Barcelona and Catalonia, I think, in terms of those particular issues. You can't really talk about intervention 
and design without thinking of these issues. Because the decision to just let a city sprawl, as in the case of South Africa, actually depends by this amazing pledge made by Mandela's uh, first national democratic government, now nearly 20 years ago, to provide every African family, every black African family, with a, fa with a house. But the house they had in mind is this. It's a shed. It's a bungalow. And therefore, you get the most extraordinary sprawl in that city compared to elsewhere. Or you have the informal development which goes unchecked. At the other end of the scale, I took this picture only a few months ago over Dallas. I mean, if you want to think of, are we building an infrastructure which is literally unsustainable, that's all you need. Right? This is happening as we speak, and you can imagine not only the impact in terms of driving cars, having to drive a car, there's no other way, you can't make public transport sustainable here, but the impact just on solitude, on being alone, if you're a mother or a father, uh, with uh, kids and you need to uh, connect with others, where do you do that? Where do you connect? Where do you meet? And I think these are issues which are very much there. Now, I've alluded to the fact that you can't talk about urban form without talking about sustainability. Um, this is very, very simple and familiar map. I could have used Barcelona on the right-hand side if I wanted to. But if you take the urban form of two cities that, roughly speaking, are the same sort of income, I'm not, not uh, per, per person, um, the roughly speaking the same sort of population, four or five million. And in black, you show the footprint of the city. You see Berlin there and you see Atlanta there. It's not by chance, of course, that only 8% of the population in Atlanta use public transport, mainly poor black people, and nearly 80% and growing in the case of Berlin. So these are decisions. Someone's made that decision to either allow the city to go unchecked, to serve private interest, to uh, support landowners who can benefit from it, or to actually control investment and bring in sort of public uh, infrastructure of the sort. Now we know that the type of environment on the left is going to create the type of pollution which amounts to smoking a packet of cigarettes every day, every day, packet of cigarettes if you live in Beijing and you breathe this sort of air. So it's not a mystery anymore. Everyone actually knows that. And some work done by colleagues at New York University actually show that the issue of uh, uh, sprawl is very much there. Even though many of the cities they've looked at, nearly 200 cities, have grown over 250 percent in population, surely numbers, their spread is over 400 uh, percent. So the issue of physical dispersal and uh, population growth is absolutely there. So this raises the question of infrastructure again. What infrastructure are we building and for whom? I think Carlo mentioned the statistic indirectly, but look at that. The USA used that amount, it's a very large amount of cement, throughout the 20th century. China has used it in a much shorter period of time. And there are ways and ways of doing this. You can either just let things go, as I've referred to before, or you can actually look at um, uh, the investments being made by Copenhagen, in fact, New York, London, and I think also Barcelona at the moment, where over time, the amount of energy we use per person actually reduces rather than increases, even though the economy is growing in these cities. You know, and sometimes things work and sometimes don't. This is an extraordinary picture of all the unused uh, rental bicycles uh, for, uh, in, 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 in China simply because the technology of the bicycles has changed so quickly that they're no longer needed. So sometimes we make investments and uh, innovations, but we don't know where things go. Let me show you the comparisons between th three cities that will be familiar to you to bring this point home of the connection between uh, physical form, density, and transport. New York, London and Hong Kong. What we've tracked here on the left-hand side is where people live and on the right-hand side where people work. So in London, it's a pretty low-density city, actually, compared to nearly all the cities I'm sure represented in this room. Lots of front and back gardens and lots of public space and two- and three-story houses, that more or less. But it's a global city. 
And we have nearly um, one million people actually coming in every day to work, very international, very global sort of markets in the city of London. You need an incredibly expensive and extensive public transport system to actually make this work, and we do have one. New York, interestingly, same sort of population, roughly nine million people, but the density of where people live is much higher. But the people who come to work is even higher than that. But you can see how the two are correlated. But there's Hong Kong, where you have, in terms of the images that we saw, much higher densities in terms of where people live, but also closer in terms of the work densities on the right. And therefore, it's not surprising that these cities have very high percentage, I'm sorry, very high percentages, some of these cities, of public transport use, but none of them as high as Hong Kong. 93% of the population uses public transport to get to work, and average commuting times of a city of 7 million or something like 20 minutes. Again, this is to do with political choice. It's not God-given that the things can be one way or another. And I think really uh, just touching upon work that we're doing now, the problem could not be more intense than in the continent of Africa. Now, Lagos I've referred to before as one of the cities that is highly, highly informal in its growth. But look at that middle statistic. 12 million young people enter the job market every year. Very, very young population, families of four or five children, even though compared to families in the agricultural rural areas in the cities they're dropping, but still there are four or five children, so very, very young. There's an extraordinary potential, but also a poss possibility of creating areas of vast unemployment, particularly for young men in their teenage years, which we know what levels of problems that actually causes uh, over time. There are exceptions. Addis Ababa has a very centralized regime, I have to say, They've built, in the last four years, four years, 250,000 publicly subsidized homes with a little bit of help with Chinese money, which at one point they will repay. But it is public housing, and the uh, allocation is made by lottery as opposed to by uh, contact or anything else. So there are really interesting models happening out there which at least challenge the questions of inequality. Now, many of you will have seen this photograph too many times. It's my fault, because I showed it first at the Venice Biennale. And everyone thought at the time, it, it's a Photoshop, right? It can't, can't be possible that you have on the left-hand side a favela in Sao Paulo without access to water and everything else, and on the right-hand side, you have apartments where people are so wealthy that everyone has a swimming pool on each terrace. Now, just to remind ourselves, every city in the world has this level of inequality. Right? Some is more extreme than others, but inequality is there for all. It's not uh, impossible. Barcelona has it uh, as much as Rome, or certainly London, and I'll come to that. The real question for me, and as a design issue for you, is the wall. Are we actually creating situations where the difference is cast in stone between people at a particular moment in time and in the future. I'm optimistic about cities, and in fact, this favela here is beginning to change. People's life is improving, education is beginning to uh, make a difference, some of it is actually being redeveloped, but the question is for me that the wall will unfortunately remain and keep that difference going. So what are we doing, both design-wise and uh, politically, to avoid that? What this shows you is three cities, Rio, London, Hong Kong, to prove the point that in the darker green, you will always have pockets of deprivation. The question is whether, as in Rio, they're ghettoized on one side, as it happens in the case of Rio, and what services do you provide. In London, it's more patchy in many ways. It's not like Chicago or Los Angeles, where you have a total divide, and it's also ethnically uh, divided as well, not just in terms of income. Uh, and how do you actually intervene in that I will talk about in a second. But I was extraordinarily uh, impressed when a few weeks ago I'm involved with something called the Mies Crown Hall America's Prize, which was given to a project in the north of Peru, but the shortlisted prize included this project by MMBB and Menendez de Roja, which is effectively a workers club right at the heart of the toughest part of Sao Paulo, really, really rough area. 
And it's a practically free workers' club with a swimming pool right at the top of the city. It's completely changing the dynamic of how the city is lived and experienced through one building. So I'm trying to say there is hope if we, in a way, get it right. Sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. Rio de Janeiro tried a number of years ago to improve access to this area, one of the favelas uh, over there, but unfortunately the whole thing was stopped because they couldn't support it and, uh, and make it sustainable. Instead, in the case of Medellin, well known, I'm sure I don't need to go through this in the case of Colombia, the transport system, this is their transport system, very steep hills, was connected with libraries, with social services, with housing, and a city with a very high, in fact, the highest homicide rate at that point 20 years ago in the world is now a, practically a tourist town. I mean, things do change. But what we're building around us is still gated communities, enclaves of this sort, and unfortunately, many of the architects trained, even in this institution, certainly in the ones I know in London, end up maybe building extraordinary funky things with glass or curvy tops or whatever, but in environments of this sort. So really the challenge to everyone in the room here is understanding what is happening at a wider scale using a different lens and I guess a much more socially aware lens. Now no one more than the person who is speaking tonight at uh, the Palau de Musica, I think, with Alfred Brendel, the pianist, Richard Sennett has captured this issue better with the, his work over years on the notions of the open city. An open city is one that is, you know, maybe it could be like London, it could be certainly Barcelona, but which has the properties that everyone here will recognize from the famous Nolly map of Rome from the 18th century, where the public spaces of the city are connected also through the buildings and open to different constituencies at most of the time of day or night of this extraordinary part of the city. So the challenge is what the hell do you do when faced with a new development on the fringes of London, parts of Hong Kong, not to mention Lagos or elsewhere. So let me spend 10 minutes, if that's okay, Carlos, on this project in London. And I have to immediately give a sort of um, advertising broadcast. Anything we've done in London with the Olympics that is good is simply copied from Barcelona, right? Just uh, anything that's bad from everywhere else, okay? So, but, uh, and I mean that quite literally because the people involved like Richard Rogers, uh, the architect who was the chief advisor to Ken Livingston, the mayor, and others like me were highly inspired by working with Maragall, with Jean Clos, and other mayors here after the Olympics, not obviously before that. Now, what is interesting about London is that unlike most global northwestern cities, unlike, it actually is growing. The own goal, the terrific own goal of Brexit, which I hear from yesterday's news is now even worse as a prospect that uh, it might be, will have an effect in terms of its growth, but instead of reaching 11 million people, we might be reaching 10 million. But it continues to grow and it continues to grow mainly with international uh, immigration because of its business. But it's a city, as I've alluded to, which is actually quite deeply divided at very profound levels. And I showed you this map earlier, but I'm just reminding you of it again. There is the River Thames, so roughly cutting through it. This is referred to as East London because it's where the working port of London used to be two, three hundred years ago when it was very active and it all stopped very dramatically in the 70s and 80s because of containerization. So a big port was put out there and all the jobs were lost. But interestingly, London, unlike many, many cities, has a wealthy, affluent fringe and a relatively poor and deprived center and east. If you did this in Paris, it would be exactly the opposite. The edge would be actually beyond the periphery, would be quite deprived, and the center would be incredibly wealthy. So again, this is not an attempt to say there's a solution that fits all, but an encouragement to all of you working in cities in the future to understand what is the context within which we're operating. And at the London School of Economics, you know, we have to be much more serious about how it is. I mean, in the end, you know, every city there's a zone where only very rich people can live and the rest of us academics included are losers. But what's been happening in London is continuous waves of investment by design 
towards the east for reasons that in a way I've explained. So when the competition was run uh, for, the, for the games, 2012 games, so a number of years before that, the winning team, which at that point was led by Kess Christianse, the uh, Dutch architect, was to say very simply, let's try and make a place that after the games ends becomes part of the city. Very familiar and you know where those ideas come from. And the place, the location of the Olympic site is in the worst, most deprived possible area in London. So if you're going to spend around 15 billion euros of public money, why not spend it where it's needed and where over the next 20, 30 years is going to make a difference? That we borrowed very much, I think, in terms of its political objectives. So from that sort of site, incredibly cut off in terms of public transport, uh, in terms of roads, motorways, and everything else, uh, disused railway lands in roughly 2005. We're beginning to move towards the realization of this. This is a computer uh, image of it, of what might happen in the next 5, 10, 15 years. From that to that. I mean, that's very much the idea behind it. I would say that if we take Carlo's idea of the guts of the city, for me, the guts that are as important are the connections between pedestrians, uh, transport, and others. The site of the Olympics, because it was a transport railway area, was only enormous, had nothing on it in streets except for this one major road cutting through it. The first thing we did with the Olympics was to actually spend a large amount of the infrastructure budget, roughly a billion euros, on making 38, 38 different connections, some of them very small, uh, pedestrian bridges, cycle bridges, but making the whole part of this city, which was disconnected, much more connected, and I think that is part of the beginning of making a sustainable, inclusive piece of city, not unlike other parts of London. So some installations, of course, like the velodrome designed by Hopkins and partners, were there and left permanently and are still used by communities who are there today. Uh, others, like the main stadium, was retrofitted from an athletics ground to a football ground and it's being used now. But interestingly, in terms of design, and it comes down to actually, in this case, actually physical infrastructure, as you well know, Olympic Games sometimes have up to 200,000 people coming out of different venues and bumping into each other, going from the basketball final to the 100-meter final, etc. The greatest danger is that you get crushing. So you have vast amount of space to avoid that. The problem is that those vast spaces, if they're then to become a piece of city, are too bloody vast. They're empty. Any community will just not be able to sort of connect. So what actually happened is that the design of the infrastructure was designed to take that into account. What you see here is the construction of the bridges in two parts. One was to be permanent and one was to, after the games, actually be taken away to be reduced. So this principle of sustainability was actually built into uh, the whole approach. And the same applies to the Zaha Hadid uh, swimming pool, but there's the bridge in its reduced state as it, it was. Some things we didn't keep, there was no need to. We don't play basketball in the United Kingdom, we're all too short and fat, so there's no point. So we had a very nice temporary structure built by uh, the architect Chris Wilkinson, but it was demounted and it was replaced, and you'll see it here, by housing, which is part of the new community of nearly 20,000, 25,000 people in the area. Very similar operation to the Olympic village over here. Zaha Hadid built, uh, this extraordinary structure. Uh, she was someone I knew relatively well and had the pleasure of walking with her during the Olympic Games to the swimming pool to see one of the events. And as many of you will know, the swimming pool event is the first event in the Olympics. It has an enormous amount of tickets are sold. And they make lots and lots of money out of it. So they had to have seven, as many seats as possible, 17,000 seats. Now, if a swimming pool is going to become a community swimming pool for us or our families, you don't want 16,960 empty seats there, right? So, so they came up with this idea of these temporary infrastructure. So you retrofit the building. 
And walking there with Zaha, I can't do her accent, but some of you knew her. She was saying, what is this shit? What is this shit? I said, you designed it. Said, well, you know, I don't like this. Okay, that's what she designed. She designed a structure that could be retrofitted and now has been retrofitted so that you have these big, amazing windows rather than sort of the, the temporary seating for the event. So this notion of resilience in built form, architectural form, applies at the urban level, the Nolly plan, and even to a degree at the Olympic Village, which is what it's like uh, now as you walk through it. What is interesting is how things also have to change in terms of the client, the sponsor, the, the organization like a university or uh, the games uh, entity itself, which needs, you know, comes up with ideas, but maybe things change. Life changes. You get Donald Trump in the United States. You get a global crisis. Things change. What actually happened in the case of London is that next to the Olympic, uh, uh, the venue for the uh, aquatic center by Zaha, there was not much of an idea of what to do over there, so we put a park in. That's what everyone does when you don't know what to do. Over time, actually what happened is that two or three major cultural institutions in London, the Victoria and Albert Museum, which is in central west London, one of the great dance uh, institutions, but also the BBC and uh, other organizations decided to have an East London location. So these are the buildings, some by John Toomey uh, and Sheila O'Donnell, the Irish architects and others, which are going to be built there over time. So there's a complexity and intensity of program which wasn't expected, but the master plan was flexible enough to absorb this change. Here's one more example. These big blocks, which are called media centers, is where vast cavernous spaces where people are interviewed after the games, are always left behind and no one knows what to do with them. They become empty, leaking places like in Athens. This has been designed to be cut up and retrofitted and now actually is home to a major urban research laboratory of uh, University College London and other facilities like that and employs around 7,000 people just in this facility here. Not everyone is happy. You, know? you begin to do this in sensitive, fragile areas of the city, you get pushback. So there's a political dimension again of how you actually manage this person. I have to say from the beginning, having been involved with the mayor's office and then with the Olympic Delivery Authority, where there was total sense, we don't want these middle class bastards to come and take us over, there's been a change. And there's been a change because of this. The impact of this project only since 2012 has actually created that many jobs. And quite a lot of them are actually designed, enforced by law, to be with people who live in the local area. And a lot of them are actually for women who uh, live there who would not have had access to jobs because of the temporary nature of the activities. So in our case, in the London case, certainly the notion of actually thinking of planning, thinking of design in terms of acknowledging that cities like human bodies are fragile. There's a metabolism which is weak. You need to be agile in responding to it and therefore the issue of resilience needs to be understood in that way. So London is, Barcelona also, and other cities are much more incremental. And I think if I go back to the work that we've been doing through our research at the LSE, what we're finding is that if anything, cities are actually becoming not incremental, uh, they're much more using Richard uh, Sennett's language again, rather than open and incremental, they're becoming brittle and closed. In other words, they're very difficult to adapt and change. This is just one area of a piece of city, which happens to be Jakarta, which is totally recognizable to everyone here. How can you begin to change this over the next 20, 30 years in terms of the agendas that we've been talking about? Well, there are positive examples. I think what is happening in Hafen City on the waterfront in Hamburg is a really interesting model, the master plan by case, Christian, of how you can reconnect an old city to the waterfront, something you understand here. But the scale at which it's been done, the importance given to public space, the connectivity is absolutely central to that debate. We saw Seoul before for other reasons, but even there, 
public spaces or big traffic roundabouts are just being humanized again by doing interventions of this sort. And even at the smaller scale, there are many, many projects that, of course, some are in this new publication, which look at how you can use self-build and personal engagement of local residents to make a difference in the toughest environments. So these issues of incrementality and the smaller scale do work, but I think they have to be within a much broader political vision of where the city is going. I think to understand, and this is, one of the fi this is the final slide, what cities, what urbanization is about, one has to accept that it's a changing process, it's an iterative process, and it's necessarily incomplete. And part of our role as designers is to accept that. Thank you very much. Thank you, you both, Carlo, Ratti, and Ricky Bart, for being here in the school and for your interventions. Thank you, Carlos, uh, for bringing the Biennale to the school. I think that all those who are committed with uh, teaching and the public school and the public university uh, will agree with me that we need to open the, the school to the city and to uh, outstanding academics and researchers, as you both are. Um, uh, you are uh, friends and you know each other for, uh, you have been uh, working together or knowing each other for years, so I'm just putting some questions on the table and you can just go on with the dialogue. Um, the first one would, would follow something that Carlo pointed in his intervention is, um, and it's related with uh, something that um, Ricky Burdett uh, explains in, in the chapter of your book that it's also translated in this uh, Barcelona magazine that you have all. Um, you, you talk about this semantic thing on the word shape, how it could mean something on policy, or shaping uh, politically the, the city, but also shaping it in form. And the question would be for you both, how all these uh, data analysis or all this collecting and gathering data could work in the physical shape of the city. So it's clear that the, the policy and how we can manage this data for policies, it's clear, but how can we use it for the physical aspect? No, just, just, just to clarify, sorry, too loud? Just to clarify, the, 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 the word shape in English is a noun, a form, a vase as opposed to a plate, or the word shape in English is a verb, to shape uh, a discussion. So that, that, that was the basis of that point. Yeah, um, let, 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 let me say something. I have a suggestion actually for a discussion. Yes, you know, Rick and I have been on each other for a while, but you know, if, if you do a conversation where everybody says, you know, oh, you know, I agree with you, I agree with you, it gets very boring. So I would suggest we get out of the way what we agree about, and then we'll try to have something where more find the things we disagree about, so it's more fun. Um, but I'll tell you what we agree about. I think we take the two presentations, I focus on just one dimension. Ricky showed many more, a much more holistic presentation. I think some of his, uh, I'll tell you later if you want, Samuel, some of the, the issue of segregation is vital. We're actually using, for instance, now telecommunication data to measure segregation. But if you want to, to take one thing, where certainly the two presentations deal with, is uh, something we were mentioning before with, uh, with some of you before the, 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 before the, the, the beginning, um, is that, you know, uh, I think we both believe, Maki Fuller would have said it, that this is like a utopia or oblivion moment for design and architecture. So design and architecture keeps on doing what Ricky said, you know, that kind of glass buildings with funny shapes and so on. You know, it's doomed. It's going to be totally irrelevant. It's going to be oblivion. But only if we tackle the main challenges of our then we can actually have the chance to have an impact, and then, you're, then is where you utopialize. And the main challenges Ricky showed in a much more holistic way is about you know, the politics of the city, it's about you know, crucial issues, who makes decisions, how you time communities, how different communities come together. It's about almost like the very notion of citizenship. You know, cities, cities didn't exist 10,000 years ago, and then come together. It's this beautiful human invention to bring us together so we can exchange ideas, we can exchange goods, we can exchange chromosomes. Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, what is behind the city. 
And, uh, and so I think if you are ableist designers and planners and architects to tackle the main issues today, then you know, yes, you know, we have the ability to shape the moral environment. If we keep on doing on beautifying, and I like that we use the word shape, you know, it's just plain with funny shapes, not with a word shape or with a noun, then you know, then you know, we might well change uh, job, and we might, we might well shut down this architecture school, one of the most important ones, and then uh, all the others one, the one where I am at MIT and, uh, and all the others, because then it doesn't make sense. So I think that's where probably both of us agree. You saw two different, almost complementary ways. I decided to focus on a very narrow thing, you know, the guts of the city, something you usually don't see. Enrique clearly gave you a much more holistic thing. We could talk about it. I think that, you know, the dimensions also can benefit today from your analysis tool. Uh, I'll tell you briefly this, and I'll leave it to Ricky. So I think this is where we really agree. Um, a, kind of a, a couple of years ago, the King of Belgium came to us and said, you know, well, you know, there's a big issue. If you think about Brussels, it's an amazing city. And, um, uh, is, you know, it's also one of the capital. But he told me it's one of the cities with the highest number of foreign fighters per capita. People who went to fight for and his question was, you know, can we get a, can we understand better what is going on? And so there we started looking at all mapping all the telecommunication flows in the city to look at segregation. And we started doing it in Brussels, but also we are doing it now. It's a piece of work we're doing with, uh, some of you might know, Ed Glazer, who's a, a, an economist at Harvard, and also with Richard Florida. We're working with them on analyzing this data. And, and basically, it's, uh, we're looking at different cities. We're looking at uh, Singapore, we're looking at uh, Brussels, such as Paris, Lyon, Marseille. And uh, what you can do if you use communication data, think about cell phone data, you can look at two things. How people eat, meet in space and how people connect across social classes. And so if you do a graph, you've got on the x-axis, you've got income, so the poor and the rich. And then on the y-axis, you've got the level of segregation. What you see is two, kinds, two classes of cities. You've got cities who are somehow healthy, or at least healthier than, you know, based on today's standards, where actually the segregation grows. The rich people tend to be segregated, and probably there's not much we can do, do about that. You know, they want to stay with the rich and live in richer neighborhoods and so on, but everybody else connects with the whole society. So it goes like, you know, like a curve like this. But then you've got a few dysfunctional cities, and those have a V-shaped graph. And it means that also the other side of the curve, you know, people with low income, the poor people also segregate themselves. And if you know Brussels, think about Mullenbeck in the core of the city, is a place that's almost like an anchor, where a lot of the population doesn't connect with the others. And so you know, understanding that is crucial and vital. We can understand it to a way we could just a few years ago. And then we can take action by actually creating space to bring people together. And that's why the MVRDV and the Mendes da Rocha project in Sao Paulo is so good, uh, because uh, there's, there's always been a very important difference between the two main cities in, Sao in, in Brazil, Sao Paulo and Rio. Sao Paulo is a city where if you're rich, you can actually hop by helicopter from one enclave to the other one, from one skyscraper to the other one, even never touching or looking at the favelas. And Rio has an amazing integrator, and that's the beach. If you think about Copacabana, Ipanema, and so on, it's a place where the whole community comes, and that creates a different relationship between, you know, at least just connecting, sharing that human friction that mixes us together is the core of the city and it is the beginning of integration. And that's why doing that in, in Sao Paulo, another beautiful building that opened just in Sao Paulo is the fund uh, Foundation Moreira Sales, which is on Paulista. Again, a beautiful building that has a public space at the core. You might have seen it's, you know, it's a beautiful glass box that inside is like a public space that goes to the top. And so doing that becomes the, be is the beginning to create the human friction, which is really what a city is about bringing us together. Well, the nice thing is that the second project, not, not only the first one, was also one of six shortlisted for the Miss America's Prize, uh, the one yeah. you mentioned. Um, I'm still waiting for where we're going to disagree, but we'll wait for Carlo to tell us about that. And I think we'll have to shift in, dobbiamo uh, farlo in italiano, perché poi siamo assolutamente più coerenti con la nostra ansia, ansia viscerale psicologica. But I'll go back to being English and distant. Um, and, uh, Scusi, vuoi parliamo italiano, so. Uh, Ca Catalan is an Italian dialect, yeah. no? <laughs> just just, just to, to, to go, I mean, your, your, your question, just for the moment, to go back to it, um, is, so, so what? So what? Right? Yeah. Effectively, yeah. so what? We, you know, we get all this data and what can you do? Well, just listen to what Carlo said about responding to 
a, a political anxiety in a small, supposedly highly civilized country, Belgium, um, with an enormous social problem. Right? And that problem has accumulated over the years for all sorts of reasons which go back to colonial times, assimilation or non-assimilation of immigrants, etc., etc. Just think of what he actually said. The, the, the mere fact that that information is now available at least allows people to make certain amount of uh, decisions. What I could add, uh, Carlo, to what you were saying is that it's, it's not that you're going to just have, and you've identified with your work with Ed Glazer and, and Richard Florida, uh, that there are differences, substantial differences in, um, uh, in deprived and non-deprived. You know, we, we know that. But it's the size physical size of that difference. And I, I, I am sure that these are the sorts of things that he can look at, is if you have very large areas of deprivation, think the south side of Chicago, all black, all deprived. I'm simplifying enormously, but no. Uh, think of the edges of Paris, mainly North African immigration, etc. The need to actually make up for your physical alienation through other forms, through religious beliefs, through extreme uh, forms of cohesion, whatever that is, I think is, is, is an issue. Now, there's an ethical dimension about what you do with this information, right? That's very clear, and maybe, Carlo, you can talk about buildings and cities that listen to you uh, in, in, in a moment, but, but there's an ethical issue there. But on the other hand, you have that uh, information. From my work, rather than this sort of work, I found that, and we're working now with a, a lot of um, mayors and cities in Africa, they just don't know what they have. I mean, the, the, the mere fact that one can try and say, look, compared to this city, that most African leaders and investors have one model. They all say, we, where we are now, you know, relatively low growth, and we're going to go up there. You saw all the graphs, et cetera. They have one model, Singapore, and Seoul. Right? Now, the amount of money that Singapore invests in physical infrastructure, the whole of Africa won't be able to invest probably in the next 10 years. Right? I mean, it, it, that, it just, they don't have the cash, uh, let alone the political control. So that's where it becomes interesting in terms of actually providing that information. Also say it's completely unrealistic to go from there to there. There are different forms of the curve that you have to, I think, work with. So I think not, I mean, providing objective knowledge, objective knowledge is one thing. If you go to the city statistics of many of these departments, right, that's, maybe that's an advantage we have, Carlo, is that actually we provide the data. Because if you look at uh, the, you go to Delhi or Mumbai and you ask them what percentage of the population is living in slums. Well, if you ask the mayor's office or the chief minister's office, as it's called there, it's a tiny amount. And by the way, in 10 years' time, there will be no slums in Mumbai. Oh, yeah? You know, that, that sort of thing. So there's a political dimension to data, uh, of course, which is there. So at one level there. The second point I would make is, and he's the king of it, we are the young nephews, just to visualize it in certain ways that is understandable to everyone, right? And, politically, and also to, to people who make political and, and investments, make investments, private and to, to actually be able to un visualize these things. Right? You know, Ed Glazer is a close friend of both of us. If you look at Ed Glazer's graphs, you have no idea. Right? No, no idea what he's talking about. Right? If you listen to him, you just about get it, more or less. And then if you translate what he said, we all understand it. Right? But it, it has a sort of complex process of, of, uh, of I, I guess, uh, interpretation, shall we say. And I think there's something there purely the methodology and its representation which has a value. Of course, what you do with that is more complex. I think, if I can add just a quick thing, and, uh, and uh, let me try again. Uh, it's not easy, but I'll, uh, I'll decide to, to see also what are the differences, you know, try to, to see. I think somehow uh, what you're saying is that um, you, you just by looking and mapping uh, and understanding is a first step, and it's totally true. You know, again, if you look at Serda, he was dreaming for this kind of science of cities, 
where you got all the data so you can design the city better. If you think about Elise Reclus, who was one of the, modern, the great modern plan planners of the modern era, he said in order to plan, you need to survey first. So today we can do a survey. I mean, R Ricky showed us beautiful surveys of the city, of dimensions that otherwise are not very clear, that we can really measure, measure better. At the same time, I would argue that Ricky is uh, more like a scientist, and we try to be more designers. But to do that, let's look at the word design. Uh, design in the, in the kind of in the Anglo-Saxon way of, uh, you know, in, 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 I don't know how you translate, it's not design like, you know, uh, the design of an object, but design is overall, I don't know how you say it in Spanish, el proyecto, it's a, design is a combination of architecture, engineering, planning, and so on. Design is that. And so, uh, as we are in a school of design, broadly speaking, you know, what do you think is the definition of design? Any thoughts in the room? Just raise your hands. What, what's design for you? Any ideas? Come on, guys. That's what you do for in life, every day. How do you define it? It's not America. It's not <laughs> okay, let's say one at a time. Yes? Disposition. I like it. Okay, disposition. Okay, so what type of disposition? Could you elaborate a bit more? Thank you. Um, I mean this position, this position because when you use different architectural elements, you tend to create different spatial relations in city too. So how you, dis how you dispose those elements may affect all different relations. So design is a really part. Oh, this it's like you know, shaping the, the built environment, which is good, but you know, what is behind it? I mean, why do you do it? What are the key principles? You know, any other thoughts? Let's uh, just you know, speak loud, we'll, we'll all hear. Yes. Create something new. I like. It. I like it. Anything else? I see. Research the possibilities. Great. Yeah. Apply, applied art. Applied art. Applied art. Yeah. Okay. Applied art is very different. Any other thoughts? But I think you know. I think it's. Uh, I think all of this goes into the same in, in the same direction. Also, if you think about art, you know. Again, then we should define art. But for me, the most beautiful definition of art is if you look at John Dewey and artist's experience, art is a way to rethink, to create additional parallel universes with our experience. But going back to this, I think, you know, you, we heard different definitions. If you combine them, um, to me, probably the nicest definition of design is the one you find in a, in a great book by Herb Simon. Herb Simon was a Nobel Prize winner, a researcher, a, you know, a, a, a mathematician as well. He wrote a beautiful book called The Science of the Artificial. And the artificial is what you're dealing with. Is about you know the world we live in. It's about the objects, the homes, the things that uh, that, that are part not of the natural space but the artificial. What we we share. And in his definition is that you basically science looks at how the world is. Design on the other hand looks at how the world could be. What he says how the world ought to be. And I think that's the amazing thing about what we do is looking at possible ways to shape the space around ourselves. So many of you you know in different different starting points have mentioned that is looking at what hasn't been done yet. Looking at the future, looking at how we can build it. And so for this, I think, you know, Ricky somehow is more like a scientist, I would say, you know, because he will get the, the data to look at how the world is and, you know, understand it in a much better way. And what we try to do is uh, usually to start with a design question. And I'm not saying, you know, both, we need both things in, uh, in life, we need both things in, in architecture and planning, in design in general, but we usually try to start from a design question, which is, you know, how could the city, how would the supermarket be if you know where all the products are coming from? What would be the consequences of that? Or, you know, how could we redesign the waste management system in a different, more efficient way? And then, of course, you need science to answer the question. You need to have the data. But ultimately, you're looking at design question. You know, how can we better understand health? Those are all, all design questions you know, about how the work could be, how the present could be different. And to me, again, it goes back to, to really this utopia or oblivion moment. If you look at uh, how we can use design to let our world devolve into better possible different futures, then you know we can really have a lasting impact. If we just look at design as beautifying things, you know, again, you know, let's shut down all the design schools around the world and uh, go and do something that's more fun. Um, I want to add an additional small thing. Today it looks like things are changing fast. Now if you if you talk to philosophers, it's difficult to quantify the rate of change. But you can look at, you know, but 
certainly there's a few data points. Think about how the world of the artificial, like how computing power changes. You know, those are exponential curves. Look at the latest book by Tom Friedman, also looks at this aspect. Look, this is the first time in the world, in, in the history of the universe, we've got companies that start from zero, like Nokia, get masters of the universe, the biggest in the world, one of the biggest in the world, and get back to zero in like 20 years. They never happened before. And that is happening anyway also with cities. I mean, look at the changes we are seeing now with mobility. You know, the, the big biking problem, we saw the beautiful picture of the bikes in China. You know, those are, was an innovation with the uh, doctor's bikes. And then, you know, you got the first generation, and then all of them are, being, are becoming trash. You get the second generation. Now there's all these electric scooters in the United States. So, so there's a lot of innovation. Innovation is somehow is going moving faster. We can discuss it, but I think from many data points, innovation in the artificial world is moving faster. It's only to find a better way as designers to accelerate the change. And accelerating the change means working, working on the science, on the data that capture the transformation. And then it also means working on the design side. In design side, again, it's about looking at possible future. And then I think letting citizens decide. And here is a huge difference versus architects in the 20th century. But if you want, maybe we'll go back to that in a moment. It's about uh, how we can actually do this in a way that helps we can, as designers look at possible, plausible transformations of the present. But then, you know, engaging people in making the decision of what type of city we want to be. We, we should get back to that. Yeah, I, I, I would add something, taking your point there. You are talking about design, and it seems that we relate it uh, also with the answers to objects. And also when we talk about incremental, flexible cities, we always think on examples of buildings. Uh, the, the example of Previ or Aravena are always on buildings. But do you think that it's possible to... to to imagine what is incremental or flexible urbanisms in the, in the sense that you in your also in your chapter in your in your paper you say that um, and we I think that we all agree and we all know it that a city uh, needs a time for ma for maturing for just uh, keeping culture a culture a history just to, to attracting people now the paradigm has changed, there's people, and now we have to make cities for them, and then the culture will come if it comes. But how can we relate this, uh, these words, this uh, flexibility or uh, um, design or whatever, with this high speed collecting or real time collecting data with something that requires time, like city? So how we merge this super fast thing with a Yep. Low pace. Well, I mean, first of all, if, if somehow, Carlo, you're trying to be uh, aggressive by calling me a scientist and calling yourself a designer, you're failing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to be a scientist in <laughs> Insofar as to, to actually look at the world in an objective way, draw some conclusions, and then you move on, I, I, that, it's not a bad thing, and particularly not a bad thing amongst architects. Right, because for too often in the last century or so, you know, there's been an attempt. Let's mm -hmm. create a community, let's do preview, let's mm -hmm. do this. Mm -hmm. And frankly, let's be honest, mm -hmm. the, 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 the success, success story is not. The downside, and what I could possibly be offended by, I will come back to it, is the implication that it's backward looking rather than forward looking. Right? I, I think that's sort of what you say. You're claiming the territory of the, uh, I, I'm looking forward, I'm a designer, I'm wanting to understand the future. That could be true, even though I don't really understand, if I'm playing devil's advocate, why understanding how a trash system works is an urban question, right? I mean, I, I'm gonna, in, in the sense of the livability of the city as we experience it, and I'm sure you have strong views on that. But I actually think that your, your, your question does, um, uh, doesn't pull aside the, the scientific trying to analyze what is there as a physicality and its social potential and what Carlos is saying at all. Because what is happening and what is being said, and everyone knows it, there's been an amplification of what people can do, literally, from when we wake up in the morning. Unfortunately, most of us turn on our bloody telephones. Mm -hmm. But that's what we do. That's the life, even, even my generation and older, not to mention what's happening to kids or grandchildren in terms of the way they the amplification or intensification of public space use thrives actually on uh, the sort of technology.
shortages that have been talked about. I mean, there will become a point, why do you have to even go into a supermarket? Might we not reinvent an open-air market at a certain point? I mean, when I saw those images of your supermarket, it felt like a supermarket, actually. This is getting yeah, interesting. Right? You see, we're getting, right. we're getting this kind yeah. of, this is nice, it's making the conversation. Yeah. So, so let me tell you. Let me finish. Wait. Okay. And, and, yeah. <laughs> But you, keep you, this you, in realize, mind. you you realize you that Carlo is running for mayor of your city, like right? the French prime minister. <laughs> that's that's what he's doing, right? This is your, what you're, 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 you're now I wish, but I cannot now claim, he's speak I cannot claim a, a Catalan uh, father uh, like uh, Emmanuel Valls. Right. The, yeah. I think the, the key point in answer to your question is that for too long there's been uh, a, an, uh, uh, an analysis and therefore a design of the city as a synchronous thing that it's fixed in time. It's sort of frozen in time. That, you know, the, the Le Corbusier sketch of Chandigarh, you certainly didn't want to change it, right? And, uh, and I think uh, the work of Raoul Marotta, a friend and colleague of ours at uh, Harvard, uh, on the difference between the kinetic and the static, in other words, how space is changed and the activity that actually happens there, it needs to absorb and be uh, pliable to, I would say, different forms of activity, physical and non-physical, is absolutely essential. So I actually think that we're, we're not pulling in different directions. It's quite the opposite. I mean, the amount of, uh, you know, let's call it crowd activity, which can happen without anything being organized, means that you still have to have the space where people come together and do that, right? It doesn't happen in loneliness. And that's where you started with your slides. But anyway. But, but I think this point about you know, the past and the future is very important to the question you asked, which, which is the transformation of different layers. Now, um, again, we're playing this for the sake of the argument, but the, um, if you think about uh, um, Ricky, and uh, the, what you are giving is an amazing picture of the city. And data itself, we said, can be the first design element. But to do that, you need to make it relevant to people. You need to uh, create a feedback loop where somebody sees something, you know, sees the trash, the waste, and then realizes I'm not going to use plastic bottles anymore. You need to make it somehow to get that information in a way that promotes change. And uh, I think to me your work is uh, very seductive. But it looks at um, the overall thing. If, I, if you look at uh, that beautiful diagram you had of uh, Atlanta um, versus Berlin, and you know, then if you're a citizen of Atlanta, you say, oh my God, you know, you know, that's uh, hell. And, you know, I know that you know, we've been building for decades, but you know, how do you solve it? And so I think to me that's a very important, and, and even if you're the mayor. Oh, you get the next mayor of Atlanta to say, <laughs> This is what we've got. I'm going to stop sprawl. I'm going to introduce an urban growth boundary as they have in Portland, London, yeah. or elsewhere, but and the, change the, the way it but, goes. But a lot of the, a lot of the, for instance, a lot of, once you have that level of sprawl, given that Atlanta is not growing anymore, there's no way to change it. Let's, uh, let's face it, I think sprawl in the That's United States. That's a way States, to intensify it, though. In this way, if you've got growth of people. But otherwise, you know, it's, uh, yeah. now when you've got that, you're, you're locked into a future where you know, people can only use uh, cars. Yeah. And you know, if, if, you don't, if the city keeps on growing, you can densify. But if it doesn't, you cannot. And so to me, I think, what is the next logical step? But again, we're doing this for the sake of the argument. Uh, is, well, uh, no, because Los Angeles, which is just as bad right, as Atlanta, yeah. you know, because you've met the mayor. And I, think, yeah? Yeah. I think you're working with him or whatever. Anyway, the, 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 that mayor, the new mayor in the last four or five years, is actually reintroducing buses, reintroducing trains, uh, proposing an intensification of, you know, the Uber, I can't use Uber anymore, uh, the, uh, the extreme uh, sort of dispersed city uh, ever, right? But, but the, totally. What it's I'm saying, what I'm saying is that but if you just look at that graph, if you just look at that picture, you know, you feel totally hopeless. Well, well, Unless you have a yeah. design that comes later. And so that's why okay. we probably need both. But if you look at those two pictures, even if you're the mayor of Berlin or Atlanta, or if you're a citizen of the two cities in particular, you feel totally hopeless. You say, well, we screwed up. You know, we've done for 30 years this. You know, now how do we change it? And even if you're a mayor and the city is not growing, so you, the, the question is that I think that is where, to me, starts the thing which is design. And design is actually looking at what we could we do. In the city doesn't grow, can we think about a new way of moving? Can we think about something that's quite interesting? The most interesting thing with the crisis in Italy after 2009 that I find beautiful is that people start demolishing, um, de de demolishing factories and so on just not to pay taxes and turning that back into countryside. I mean, can you look at other plants? This happened naturally, just it's uh, in order 
there's no demand for them in some parts of the country. The, the, the factory tissue has, uh, has disappeared and, uh, and then goes back to, to what it was before. And uh, again, you know, some other parts are doing well. You want to, one of the important things, for instance, in Italy is, you know, you should get every new square meter you build should be a square meter you remove somewhere else or you convert. So somehow, you know, you don't have any net additional square meters. There's already too many of them. So I think that is where design then starts and looking at uh, how things can evolve. And when you do that, you don't need to have one solution. You know, I showed you a supermarket because that was one experiment. But there's many other ways we can develop there. There's a scary way. And the scary way is the one that the mayor of Paris, the vice mayor of Paris, told me two weeks ago and, and, and said, you know, was saying, well, you know, think about Paris. The beauty of Paris is actually commerce, you know, the streets. You know, if we let it go, what happens? Question mark, if, it's a big if, but you know, if, like in 20 years, uh, e-commerce, in 10 years, e-commerce, you know, the Amazon and so on kills all of the infrastructure. You know, what will Paris be? That city where, you know, all the richness of the life industries is, is disappearing. So how do we prevent it? So that's where design question starts. And you don't want one answer. You might want to see what is an experiential supermarket. That's what we did at the Expo because that's uh, what was given to us as a brief. We want to explore what could be like a, a new distributed way which is not e-commerce. It'd be like an Amazon which uh, borrows all the little warehouses in the city, something that they, somebody who graduated from our lab now is doing in Los Angeles. Can you actually create like a digital platform to combine all the small uh, places selling things in order to become as powerful if you want as an Amazon, but still in the city, in the streets. Or, you know, there's many other things, and I think that's where design should start. And going back to the, the point we said before is that, you know, in the 20th century, people thought designers thought they had a solution. And, uh, and they produced some of the most appalling uh, urban developments we ever saw. Think about Le Corbusier, 1923, when he presents the plan was for Paris. And you all have seen that picture. The picture with his hand, it was an October day, so it was exactly more or less this time of the year, the pavillon de l'esprit nouveau, the pavilion of the new spirit in Paris. And you've all seen that picture, Le Corbusier with his hand presenting the plan voisin for Paris. His idea was simple, as you all know. Basically, raise all of Paris, demolish all of Paris, keep Notre Dame, and if you other things, a little souvenirs from the past, and replace everything with a new modernist skyscraper. And you know, that was that picture with the hand of Le Corbusier, which was the hand of the architect, but the hand of God is really what we should not do. That is what left up all of the crap that we built in the 20th century in terms of urban development. But you, you and I think what we can do, let me say, today is a different thing, is we can actually propose many things. Use design to speculate. If you look at what Tony Dan has been writing about speculative design, there's a way to speculate, to look at different transformations of the present, so then together we can decide what type of city we want. Because the future is not written in stone, it's what we will all build by all the decisions we make. What we will design, what we will help develop, what citizens will what people will do by voting for a mayor and another mayor will shape what Barcelona will be in 10, 20, 30 years. And so I think to me that's a radical difference in the idea of the designer. is not quite the solution. It's somebody who helps look at the transformation of, uh, of the present. I think you slightly conveniently left out the one thing which I'm support of Le Corbusier in his uh, one hand deciding what should happen to one of the most beautiful parts of the urban world of Paris was that when he was asked to look at that part of the world, of Paris, it had one of the highest mortality rates in the world uh, because the streets were very narrow and very dense. And as you showed in that wonderful map, uh, uh, contagion and disease was a major issue. So the idea of actually having towers, which were cruciform in plan, and you could open the windows, were all about natural ventilation and therefore benefiting public health. From that point of view, it was a solution to a problem. I think this is where we are agreeing, going back to your point. But it was just one, it was a solution which destroyed so much else. And we've had to sort of, in a way, live with the consequences of that. But there was a reason for doing that. I think one of the issues, Carlo, I'm not sure where you stand on this, is you know how, how do you become multi-scalar a certain modesty of standing back. I mean, Kate Christiansen, who we've referred to a couple of times, uses the notion of the city as law. 
you know, the, the, the ever-changing. They're, 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 if we look at the, the build form that we know works for many of the things that we don't expect, I think that's important, don't expect, don't plan for, uh, the, the modesty of the design becomes significant, because that deals with unexpected missiles in terms of time. I'll, I think that we have uh, to leave it here because you have a, a, pl a flight to catch. No, no, no. no? You said you two o'clock. Change it? No, I, I, I clearly we need to settle this. So I mean, we, need to settle it. we still have time. Okay. So if, if you want to listen. No, maybe they don't. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> um, no, the thing is that, no, please. So but let me just say, you know, um, where do we stand? Yes, you know, I think I agree with the modesty. But I think that Ricky is a big Corbusieri. <laughs> Corbusier means, you know, it's about still, you look at this systemic way. And you look at this systemic way, and somehow that points to a solution. The, 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 the Olympics project is an amazing project, but still it's a, it's a solution. And I think, you know, they could have developed many other things, some worse. Some that I believe in, in the evolution of the artificial, or the cities, is quite similar to how natural organisms work. And you know, if you look at natural evolution, it's an evolution that uh, is based on the number of mistakes. But you want to have an open platform, here we agree, that actually allows you to try things and let some develop. And see how this will, you know, you try mutation, a lot of them will die, some of them will actually be successful and transform the world. And that's how nature does. I think we're doing something similar. Many people have written about the, the way of evolution, both in the natural and the artificial, in the artificial world. And if you think about it, See, us as designers is mutagenic. And we need to try many of them. There's no one solution. We need to engage people. That's why the Corbusier was starting with, uh, we started with um, the dead part about, uh, yes, you know, was trying to make a better city for help. But no, it would have, uh, you know, killed everything else. Community and the beauty of the past and so on. So I think we need to be modest. But we need to be modest primarily because there's not one solution. We can try many. We can be mutagenic and let people. Thank you. I, I think that even if they tend to not think uh, in the same way, uh, if you just Google uh, quickly uh, the Urban Age program that started in 2005, um, they say that uh, it's something that regards it, um, it regarding the interactions between physical and social. If you do a quick Google on central uh, cities, you can see that they say that they with city physical and digital, but uh, and you merge it with how we sense and how we act. So, kind of, the, there's a point here in which um, both presentations have been uh, putting uh, all this energy on 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 giving um, information on cities. I think that uh, in in the case of the urban age program, it's. It's a, it's a wider focus, what we saw today. Uh, Carlo Ratti talked about a, a specific uh, a kind of cities. Uh, in, the, in, in this book, we have five categories. Talk also about merging, or um, you have a paper in that talks about uncertainty uh, uh, regarding mobility, but uh, uh, in the in shaping program, we, we can say emergence uh, situations, constraint situations, I think that the examples that uh, you, Carlo, gave today uh, are not, uh, or are, dif uh, are difficult to imagine in this uh, context. Uh, and I come back to the point uh, uh, that Ricky Burdett uh, was saying, okay, his, uh, we all saw this uh, supermarket and we just saw a supermarket. Uh, the question is, uh, which difference is there if the apple is given by a plastic hand or by a human hand? Or could this uh, supermarket be in Dhaka or in Addis Abeba? Or uh, here is where I want you to just. But you, you put, you put, you put, you put many, many things on the table. So keep in mind, in crucial thing. So think about you know, design again as this way to create mutations. You know, in that case, you know, you're giving mutations to them in a certain uh, space. In that case, you know, we give mutation in the space of an expo, and they told us, you know, how could the supermarket be? And you can try that. You can try a future where there's all e-commerce. 
you can try a future where there is, as I said, you know, proximity commerce becomes like a giant, connected digitally, a giant Amazon. You can try many different solutions. So I think that's what we should do. Now, the other point you're making is more interesting, the last one, is the one about, um, think about, you know, well, how can you apply this to others? It is a good point, but you need to be, you need to be very attentive to a lot of the hypocrisy that reads today. And let me give one example. Now, when we started, I didn't show it today, but we did a, in, with Ricky in 2006 at his Biennale, he is very nice when his Biennale where we, we had a space uh, in the Biennale and what we did was for the first time ever, we looked at um, uh, data from billions, of, no, not familiar, from millions of people collected in real time from cell phone in order to understand the metabolism of the city. That hadn't been done at the scale of the city. So today, some of the papers and the patents we filed at the time, MIT filed at the time, you know, are what is still used today when you now look at the map and you see how people. Now, if you think about cell phone, um, cell phone at the beginning was something that was very expensive. It was increasing the divide between the have and the have nots. And so, and you might have said, you know, well, I don't want to deal with this technology because I want to deal with the technology that actually reduces the gap. But we saw that if you start from that, even if at the beginning does it, you fast forward 30 years, and today the cell phone, the smartphone, there's more cell phone than people, the humans on the planet. There's places where people in Addis, you know, everybody has a cell phone, they don't have running water, they have a cell phone, is, uh, is what is actually aligned with a lot of leapfrogging. Where people who are behind are going ahead, or the people who are ahead, think about mobile payments in Africa, think about, I saw beautiful things with uh, fishermen in Sri Lanka. So the same technology, over time, if at the beginning, by definition, every new piece of technology at the beginning would be expensive, just a few people will have it. But then if you plan it, if you, if you see what will come later, then you know, the same piece of technology had the most amazing leapfrogging effect and you'll know, close the gap later. So don't think, you know, if we had thought at the time, at the Biennale 2006, that to make an impact on cities, you had to look at what would actually close the gap in Addis at the time, we would be totally screwed, you know, that would be irrelevant. But if you, if you look at the technology, at the beginning might be divisive, increase the gap. But if you try to see how tomorrow can actually do the opposite as it happened with these type of things, then you know, that's when, as a designer, you can play. Well, so what I'm saying is that forget about the hypocrisy. You want ultimately to generate, yes, a world with less inequality. But sometimes to do that, at the beginning, you, you might need to engage with something that uh, will not immediately be applicable. To Addis, to the to the Addis in the Jakarta of the world. So mm -hmm. let's be clear, because otherwise yeah, yeah. we get into this uh, re rhetorics, which is uh, doesn't lead you anywhere. Yeah, I just wanted to push it and push. And do you want to? Okay. So maybe uh, even we can stop it here, or open to any questions to the audience. If anyone wants to ask something to both of them, or okay, there's. Someone yes, there? feel free just to speak loud and we'll... Uh what are your ideas about that? Did you hear? Yeah, every new I, I repeat it, new every policy. new building needs 35% uh, social housing is a new policy, so what, is, what, is your, your, what are your ideas about that? Oh, I think right. Let's get a Corbusierian view. No, look, to be accused of being Corbusierian <laughs> because you have a big idea, that's fine. Right? <laughs> so to take your point, there has to be a, a metropolitan ambition of equity, wh which is translated into a statistic of that sort, right? When I was, you put, put the mic. Microphone. Oh, I hope it's not too loud. No? Right. Okay. Uh, there has to be a metropolitan idea of equity, which is translated into policy requirements such as that. I've lived through three different mayors in London. The first wanted 50% affordable housing uh, of all new projects over 10 units. Uh, the second mayor, Boris Johnson, no comment, went down to 20%. And the current mayor is saying the aspiration is 50%, but it depends where you are in the city because there are some areas that already have very, very high levels of, let's call it social or public housing, and that maybe that's not the ideal way of dealing with it. So I think to have a very a relatively high objective, but not just to be cookie cutter and have it everywhere the same, 
is probably significant in terms of getting that mix that I'm talking about. Otherwise, you get ideological statements, which we're stuck with for generations. But I think, you know, that has been, that has been the, it's a, it's a crucial question of how you make it more affordable. And certainly, what's happening in cities all over the world is that a lot of populations are being, especially younger populations, are being kicked out of the, the center because it's too expensive. So affordability is very important. That way, to me, is a very important way, but it's also a model of the past. I think, you know, the, 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 the thing is that you, when you do it, and then uh, and you do it, you and then do? you see that over time, the gentrification happens again. And we see it in Boston, where actually you have uh, some of the new developments need to have so? that. You see the, the, so? the and so you can have better solutions. Such for, in, for instance, I think, you know, can you think about how you could have a blockchain system that allows value to flow to disadvantaged communities constantly, so that actually, that you basically, through taxation and dynamic exchanges, you find a way that this will stay for longer. If you want, it's a very good solution, but it was a 20th century solution. Can we think today about better ways where we can actually transfer value so that more people can be there and so the community is preserved in the long term? Because if not, every new development will do it, but they give it 10 years, and that's gentrified again. So you don't solve it in the long term. And also, you know, once you have a city where you're not building more, then you don't fix it. If you think about, uh, you know, center of London, but there's no new developments there, you know, there's no new buildings, and so you, 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 at that point you're stuck with what you have. Is there a more dynamic way? Could I, again, I think that to me is a beautiful design question for all of you. We, um, talking about Case Christiansen uh, was mentioning, Ricky, we, we had the fortune of working with him on the master plan of the late IBA in Heidelberg. Uh, so it was, uh, Case was coordinating, and then uh, it was both our office and uh, MBRDV working on different versions of the, the master plan. And what you tried there was, uh, you know, can you think about a, something based on a sharing platform that applies to every part of the city that becomes the engine for creating more equity and affordability there? It becomes like a sharing community, almost like an interpretation of the commune. Uh, is, we, we call it a commune of the 1960s that finally becomes physical because of the, again, networks and the connectivity we have today. Now, in the same ways, for instance, looked at car sharing for ages. In the 50s and 60s and 70s, it's always failed. And now it works beautifully just because you've got data and you can know where the car is and you get it. Can you think about a similar platform in the city? Rethink about the commune, which is again a way to share value, to transfer value, to socialize, and to, and to use that using the new tech. So to me, again, let's be, that has been a great solution in the past, the best we could do. I think if you look at design for all of you, I think you can probably think about a better city moving forward where this can happen on a daily basis, not only where you build, but also on the existing part of the city. Because if not, you will never solve it. You know, if you look at the example, there's no building going there, so gentrification there, how do you solve it? You don't think so? No, I'm, uh, I've made my point. <laughs> okay, so thank you. If there are not Yes, many, there's oh, a, no, there's many, uh, no, many hands, come on. <laughs> Last one that we are taking.
Andrew, th thanks for asking. If I, if I, you know, just if I understand it correctly, it's about uh, how, you know, well, sometimes, you know, public space or parks and so on, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. How can we, first of all, understand that and get the new layers of technology maybe to, uh, to, to make them work better? And one of the things you mentioned is, for instance, production. I think production is very interesting. We actually have a paper that's, uh, that's coming out on, on production. Now, let's be clear. We'll never be able to produce all the food for Barcelona on the Barcelona footprint, or all the food for New York on the New York footprint. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the footprint, just because of the amount of sun, you know, the food is one way to take the energy from the sun, turn it into something that we can eat and power all of us for all of our activities. Each of us is around a 100 watt machine, and to, have, to be a 100 watt machine, we get those 100 watts by the things we eat that ultimately come from the sun through different conversion systems. So if you look at how many people you have and how many hundreds of watts or when you're running more, you need, then, you know, you need a bit much bigger footprint. But still, I think uh, farming actually, I think, is very, very interesting because it connects us with nature. You know, it's, uh, if you're interested in this, you know, there's a beautiful book by E.O. Wilson, who's a colleague at Harvard, a great biologist. That's called Biophilia. You know, we, for thousands of years, we've been living closely with nature. That's coded in us. And so I think, you know, I'm a great supporter of urban farming, not because, like some people say, oh, we're going to build, to, buy, to produce all the food uh, for Barcelona locally. You know, that's bullshit. We'll never be able to do it. You know, and also sometimes, in terms of energies, it makes more sense to get lamb coming from New Zealand or apple coming from New Zealand than locally just because of efficiency. In terms of energy, pure energy, sometimes it's better to have things coming from far. From an energy point of view, it's better. It's better to have tomatoes go to Northern Europe sometimes coming from the south, where you use the energy from the sun, than to farm them locally in the Netherlands, where you need a lot of artificial artificial. So what I want to say is that it's not about being always uh, locally sourced. That's not the solution, and we'll never be able to produce everything locally. But I think it's a beautiful thing because it connects us with nature, with, you know, with the magic of, uh, of life, the changes with the seasons, and we are part of that with our different seasons, yearly and, and in life. So, so I think you know, that's, that's very interesting. It could be certainly something that you can use in public space to, again, connect more, because you made that example as a, as a production. So if you look at technology more general, there's a lot of potential. But again, I don't think it's probably time to look at what could be ways to activate uh, a public space. Sometimes it really doesn't work. We're working now on, on Brasilia. Um, again, that's a design. Something we're doing in our design office. We're expanding. Uh, we're doing one of the, the, the additions to the, the master plan that was done in the 50s by, uh, in the 50s by uh, Oscar Nimai and Lucio Costa in Brasilia. And uh, we are doing this uh, new development. And certainly what you see is that the super quadra, which is what actually Barcelona is Getting to in Brazil it doesn't work well because some of the public space is too, doesn't have enough density, then it becomes no man's land. So sometimes when you've got that issue, it's difficult to activate it even with technology. But to me, the interesting thing is how all of us can think about, you mentioned production, there's many other ways where we can actually, again, go back to the very nature of design of how we can transform the places we live in many, with many alternatives, many mutations, and then let people be part of that. I don't know what else. I, I, there's a I, hand there. Okay, but it has to be super quick with a short answer. So, Carlos. So, for Ricky, please. <laughs> Very, very big question, but I, I think 
the only thing I would say to, to that is uh, my sense of the more we study cities and the more one realizes that the systems are complex and broad without saying anything about the, you know, is it, does it require the hand of the architect or a male architect or anything. I think an understanding of a, the regional dimension and how the interconnections actually work in terms of production, in terms of transport, everything else, is fundamental. I mean, I, I think even our subject is too narrowly defined as to what constitutes a city. One of the greatest critics of our work uh, at Harvard, uh, Neil Brenner, basically says we, and I, I think we do pretty broad definition of cities, uh, that we're far too narrow. That actually, uh, if you talk about cities, you have to talk about mines, mining, extraction, where do you get copper from, where do you get, you know, you've got to look at the whole ecosystem. I think that, um, there's something there, but there is a question of where do you stop. Hint. Which is not. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just say, uh, <laughs> Saro, three things. Uh, like Frank Lloyd Wright would have said, is uh, citizen, citizens, and citizens. I, I think that's, that's, that's your, your... No, that doesn't work. That doesn't work, because uh, you ask a citizen what to do in, in, in Barceloneta, uh, or ask a, city, uh, a citizen of uh, a, 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 a peripheral town here, you're going to get a very localized view of what is right and what is wrong. I, that, I, the solution I, is not there. I, I, I disagree. I think that actually, if you, there's a there was a beautiful exhibition called Architecture Without Architects in MoMA, uh, 1972, I believe. If you look at the catalog from a guy called Rudolski, you see you know, how some of the most beautiful things we all still admire were actually will built without mayors and architects. And I think they were built by citizens. What and a so romantic. I think You're a romantic. I, I think <laughs> of course, romantic. because you, you are a scientist. Yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> Okay, it's clear, it's clear that you have to come back and you have to come back together. So thank you for being here today and thank you to the audience. Thank you.